so glad that you've chosen to join us. And uh, just a special reminder that Christmas Eve is coming. We're going to have two services, three o'clock and five o'clock. And we would love it if you would not only come and bring your family, but if you would invite those that you've been investing in relationship with over these past few months so that they might be exposed to the good news uh, of Jesus here at Christmas time. We look forward to being with you then. Well, this is the last weekend that will be in our series that we've entitled, It's All Good. We've been talking about the fact that uh, when the angels came, they said that they had good news. You know, I, I, when I think about the good news at Christmas, I think about my friend Sean. Uh, Sean is uh, what I would call an occasional friend. You know the type. You connect with life transitions or Facebook posts every five to seven years and just check in. Well, Sean was a friend that I met when I was a teenager. I was 15. Sean was 12. Um, I was a junior counselor at a Christian camp, and Sean was in my cabin. Um, and uh, we got to know each other that week. Well, a couple of years later, we found ourselves at the same Bible college together. And uh, we we're both studying for pastoral ministry. We both became pastors. It was about 10 years into pastoral ministry that I heard through uh, the grapevine that uh, Sean was no longer in ministry and that his wife had checked out on their marriage. What I didn't hear in that first a bit of information was that while Sean was in ministry, he had stepped away from his faith and that his wife left him because of it. You see, the church that Sean was in, not unlike some churches, was kind of about power and control. And when certain people within the church felt like Sean had more power and control than they did because he was the pastor, uh, they kind of flipped on him. They uh, got angry. They got hostile. They mistreated him and his family. And uh, as one who's been in ministry for a long time, and I've certainly uh, been exposed to some of those moments, I, I can say two things. I can say uh, those moments are hard. Uh, but secondly, I would say that that experience is not the original version of our Christian faith. That is not the good news version. You see, the, the good news version is absolutely compelling. It's a story worth telling. It's something worth giving our life away to. And throughout this series, we've been asking a simple question. If the coming of Jesus to earth was good news, well, why is there so much resistance? Why aren't people leaning in? Why aren't they hoping that it's true? And throughout this series, we've, we've said that maybe the resistance uh, over the years has been in large part because of their response to the answer, is it true? Is all this that the Bible says about Jesus, is it really true? But I do believe that more and more often uh, in recent years, it's not the is it true question that raises resistance. It's a different question. It's the question, is it good? Is it good? You see, I think though my friend Sean would say that he walked away from his faith because his answer to the question, is it true, had changed, in talking to friends and family and uh, those that we know and have in our network in common, uh, most people would say that Sean's answer to the question, is it good, had changed. Is Christianity good for humanity? Is it good for my family? Is it good for you? Is it good for me? Well, we know going back to that initial prophecy when the angels appeared to the shepherds on the hillside, they said it was good, right? They said in, in Luke chapter 2, verse 10, they said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. It was good. It was amazingly good. It was extraordinarily compelling. It was a story worth telling. It was a story worth giving your life away 
to. And if it is, why is it that there are versions of our faith that are so ungood that people like my friend Sean are looking for the exits? I want to ask a couple of questions, and then we're going to unpack a paragraph of Scripture in answer to these questions. The first question is a simple one. It's this, it's, it's what happened. What happened to the good news of great joy which shall be to all people? I mean, no doubt the American church, the Western church, has tinkered with the gospel message, at least how it's presented publicly, right? Uh, we've Americanized the good news. We've politicized the good news. We, if this is even a word... Uh, we have prosperitized uh, the good news. We've anti-intellectualized the good news. We have internalized it, meaning it's just something we believe. It's not something that we do or live out. And in so many cases, we've simply turned the good news into fire insurance. It's a get-out-of-hell-free card. I remember when I was a kid, when I first came to faith in Christ, that was really it. It was really all about the what's in it for me. It was I, out of fear. I, I wanted to not go to hell when I died. And while I don't think there are any bad reasons for a person to come to faith in Christ, that's certainly not an ideal way to come. Because it teaches us that the gospel is about what's in it for me. You see, that's not the good news gospel. That's what I would call the pick and choose gospel, where I, I get to pick and I get to choose which parts of the gospel are for me and which are good for me and which are to accrue to my benefit, and I can just ignore or overlook the rest. I remember uh, the last time I visited my son in Washington, D.C., uh, he gave Diane and I a tour through the Bible Museum, and if you're ever in D.C., it's worth the 25 bucks and a half day of your life. You will love the experience. But there were some kind of interesting um, discoveries that I made while I was there at the Bible Museum. One of them was uh, something called the Slave Bible. It caught my eye, and I uh, paid attention. It was uh, uh, published by the Society for the Conversion of Slaves in England and for the British Empire. Now, uh, it was interesting because it was kind of a pick-and-choose version of the Bible. They took what is 1,100 chapters and they reduced it down to 300. Now, they said they had good intentions. It was to teach slaves how to read and it was uh, to teach them about Jesus, ostensibly to teach them the gospel or the good news. And yet they left out vast amounts of the Scripture because while it may have uh, been good for slaves, it was not good for slave owners. Yeah, you know, one of the verses that they left out in the slave version of the Bible, it was uh, something that the Apostle Paul said uh, that, that we cherish. It's that there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's uh, neither male or female, for we are all one in Christ. That was good for slaves, but not good for slave owners. And it was kind of left out. So here's the point. If our version of the gospel, the part of the gospel that we believe and live out in front of people, if it's not good news for Jew and Gentile, for slave and free, for saint and sinner, for rich and poor, for men and women, if it's not good news for your crazy Uncle Larry or your religiously skeptical cousin or that part of the family that's coming to Christmas this year and you really wonder how long they're going to stay, if it's not good news for your ex-husband or your ex-wife, uh, if it's not good news for them, then it's not the original news. What happened? Well, I don't know. Maybe we need to point the finger at ourselves. Here's the second question that I want to ask and answer this morning. Uh, what about me? Am I good news? Am I good news? We could 
turn that into a sentence and ask this, are you good news of great joy for all people or just for people like you? Right? That's not the original version. I mean, if that's the version we're living out, if it's good for us and it's good for people like us, uh, that's not what Jesus came to bring to the world. He came to bring good news of great joy for all people. You know, here at Bay Life, we value all of Scripture. It's all authoritative. It is all sufficient for all that we need. And yet there are certain passages and certain theme verses that we come back to time and time again. These are well-worn paths here at Bay Life because Jesus has made these a priority. Probably the verse that we preach most often here at Bay Life is John 13, 35. Let me read it one more time. A new commandment I give to you that, we, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. If you want to know if you're promoting the original version, are you living it out this way? It says, this is how others will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Loving one another is the birthright of, it is the birth mark of the believer, right? It's how we are identified in the world. It is the differentiator. It is the force multiplier for the gospel that we would love God and love others. Jesus used a, a metaphor to uh, let this play out in the Sermon on the Mount. And here's another well-worn path that we've already preached twice uh, in 2021, it's uh, found in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. That last phrase, this is how it works. This is how the good news of great joy for all people becomes this, this compelling story worth telling. That people would see our good works and their attention would be directed to our Father in heaven that they would glorify Him. Jesus couldn't be clearer. This is how we live out the original version of our faith. And if we can see ourselves as the light of the world, then we see ourselves differently. We see our enemies differently. We see our responsibility differently. We see everything in the world differently, right? We learn how to personify the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, probably the biggest turnaround story that I've ever seen in Scripture is the story of the Apostle Paul. Paul, who misguided though he was, persecuted the church. Uh, he martyred them. He tortured them. He stood by as they were stoned to death. It was his business to put them out of business. And then he met the resurrected Christ. And then he came to understand the good news of the gospel, the original version. That was good news not only for him, but for the whole world. And his entire life changed. He took all of that passion and desire and directed it away from his own personal agenda toward this compelling story worth telling. The story of the good news of Jesus Christ. In his very first epistle, his very first letter that he wrote to the church, he kind of gave his new mission statement. It's found in Galatians 5, verse 6. It says this, For in Christ Jesus, the only thing that counts, the only thing that counts, is faith, faith in Christ, expressing itself through love. That really is our mission statement. And Paul gave his life away for this compelling story worth 
telling. With the moments that we have left, I, I, I want to go to uh, a paragraph that the Apostle Paul wrote for us, for the church in general in his day and, and for the church even today. And he's essentially saying, I want you to experience what I've experienced. I want you to represent the gospel the way that I have represented the gospel my whole life. And so he gives this one paragraph and he tells us how to do it and what to do and why we're able to do it. It's found in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I want to read the bulk of the paragraph. And then we're going to break it apart, and it's going to give us some great challenge for how we can live out the original version of our faith. Follow along as I read Philippians chapter 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from his love, any participation in the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit is inside of you, and he is, if you know Christ, if, any, if you have any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. What the Apostle Paul is essentially saying is, if since you have come to Christ, you have found any uh, encouragement if it's been good for you in any way if what Jesus did in your life is good news of great joy for you if that's true and it should be then listen to this then he says do me a favor make my joy complete be of the same mind demonstrate the same love Operate as if we are all indwelt by the same Spirit. Why? Because then the compelling story of Jesus, the story that's worth telling, will begin to leak out of our life. And it will have a profound impact on those that we meet. What if every Christian lived that life? What if every church exemplified that attitude? The world would be a different place. As I unpack kind of the middle portion of this paragraph, I, I kind of want to play a what-if game with us, and I, I just want to ask three what-if questions, right? What if we were unselfish? Isn't that what Paul said? It says this, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Now, would that be good? I mean, that's awesome, right? Uh, that's who you want to share a workplace with, right? People who are unselfish. That's who you want to be married to, someone who's unselfish. That's how you want your children to represent your family in the world, uh, unselfish. I mean, maybe you wish that your father had been that way or maybe you come from a family where you are so thankful that your father or mother were that way do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit get beyond yourself what if we were unselfish do you think that would be good news to the world well i think so what if question number two what if we were humble? What if we were humble? It says this, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. It didn't say that others are more significant than you or that they are more valuable than you. It says that we are to treat them as if they were. And let me ask you the question, is that not the epicenter of the gospel message? Did Jesus not come to this earth Though he was God, empty his bucket of all the things that he could have claimed, all the privileges he could have claimed, and he gave his life on the cross as a ransom to buy us back. He treated us sinners 
as if we were more valuable than him, than his life. What if we were humble? Do you think that would be good news of great joy? I think so. What if we were unselfish? What if we were humble? Here, here's the third what if question. It's this. What if we were deferential? What if we were deferential? Isn't that what it says in the text? It says this. Let each of you not look to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. What if we just gave our life away for the lives of others? I mean, what if we put our spouse and their interest before our interest? What if we did that for the guy at work? What if we did that for the person begging for lunch money on the corner? What if we did that for the person that we love? What if we did that for the person that we don't love? Would that be good news? Oh, you bet it would be. Well, here's an obvious question, right? Uh, where does that type of attitude come from? Where does the power to live that way come from? Paul gives us the answer in the text. Check out verse 5. It says this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This, this attitude of humility and unselfishness and deferential treatment of others that only comes from one source, and you only have access to the power that it takes to live that way because you are in Christ. And then Paul goes on, and in this beautiful piece of poetry, describes how it was that Jesus lived this life out. It begins with where he began, right? Right? in heaven, ensconced in glory, sitting on a throne, ruling over his creation. And the Apostle Paul describes it with these words, who, though he was in the form of God, though he was in the form of God, he was God, right? What did he choose to do anyway? It says, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, a thing to be held to his bosom, a thing to, uh, a, a, a privilege to be maintained, right? He chose not to do that. This is really the sermon in a sentence, this verse. If I were to put it in different words, it would go something like this. Jesus leveraged his power and influence as God for the benefit of those who had less power and less influence, or maybe no power and no influence. Is that message good? Is that a good message? Oh, it's incredibly good. That the God of heaven, the God who was omnipotent, that means he was all-powerful, he had leverage on everyone and everything. Nothing existed that he hadn't created. And yet, he chose to use his power and leverage for those who had no power and leverage. Check out the last part of the poem here. But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know what the purpose of the cross was? It wasn't just to kill you. <laughs> there are much more efficient ways to do that. The purpose of the cross was oblivion. You see, the purpose of the cross was to shame you. It was to rob you of all dignity. You were crucified naked. You were crucified publicly and you're raised up on a cross, no one could stand next to you. No one could hold your hand in the pains of death. No one wanted to be publicly affiliated with anyone who was an enemy of the state. So usually no one came to your crucifixion. 
And no one would certainly ever admit that they knew you after you had been crucified. And yet this is the method of death that Jesus chose for himself. It was a method designed to make it as if you never existed and you never mattered to anyone. That is the ultimate humility. He left where he was with all the privileges of heaven. And it says he emptied himself. What if we did that with our life? What if we took all of these positional points of pride that we've kind of built up in our own minds? I'm a better socioeconomic class than you are. I make more than you do. I have more than you have. I, I'm more educated than you are. If we took all of that stuff that we filled our mind with and we emptied it out and said, I am less than no one. And whatever power and leverage I have, I'm going to use not on my own behalf, but on the behalf of those who have no power and leverage. It's essentially the, the closing challenge that the Apostle Paul gives us in this paragraph. In verse 12 and 13, he says this, Therefore, my beloved, my dear friends, right, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and and trembling as you are working out what it means to know Jesus as Savior, to have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. As you work out what it means to have all of this encouragement and comfort that comes through our relationship with Christ, as you're working out your own salvation, know this, it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. There's another translation of the scripture that takes those last two words and says, good purpose. That God is at work to fulfill his purpose in us. What is his purpose? That the world would know that there is good news of great joy for all people. You know what the megaphone for that message is? It's when we are unselfish. When we live humble lives and when we are relationally deferential to everyone else when we use what little power and leverage we have for people who have no power and no leverage in our life that the good news of great joy for all people is manifested in us that they see our good works and glorify our father who is in heaven listen my friends, our faith, living out the gospel, living out the good story of Jesus is not about what's in it for me. It's about how I can reflect the light of Christ to the world so that they would see something valuable in our Heavenly Father. This is a compelling story worth telling let's tell it well with our lives bay life church love you so much know this god loves you even more can't wait to see you on christmas eve three o'clock and five o'clock we'll see you there